All right, everyone, I guess we can officially start. Um, and I'd like to say that I'm really glad to be here. I'm really feeling the adrenaline, <laughs> even though I'm not interpreting tonight. Um, I'm going to be a speaker, and I hope you like this talk that I've put together for you. I promise not to talk for too long. And um, the good thing about this talk is that I get to join two of my greatest interests like at the moment, which are like interpretation and pronunciation. And this is my English pronunciation for interpreters talk. And before I go any further, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit, even though I've been already introduced on the Galera da Denalina uh, Instagram page, so you can see my profile there, but I have a major in journalism, any languages, Portuguese and English. I did a master's in language teaching, and I'm currently a PhD candidate in English linguistics at the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And um, I study the correlation between musical aptitude and pronunciation skills. So my research is in the broad field of second language acquisition uh, with special attention to phonetics phonology. And the title of my research project is um, Musical Aptitude in Second Language Acquisition, the Role of Musical Perception in the Production of English Vowels. And my advisors, my advisor is Rosane Silveira, Dr. Rosane Silveira. My co-advisor is uh, Dr. Charles Shang from Boston University. Um, these are pictures of previous pronunciation workshops that I already promoted. This first one was at the university, Federal University of Santa Catarina, probably in 2019. So this was one of my first pronunciation workshops, um, which I gave alongside Elizabeth Bunch, uh, who is an American pronunciation coach, and my friend uh, Cesar Tillaw. And the second one, is a picture of a pronunciation workshop targeted at musicians. This was probably the third edition that I did in Bahia. So this was probably before the pandemic. I think it was the last one before the pandemic. Um, and we, we had a chance to perform here and it was a lot of fun. So um, we are not going to be interacting much here, but Whenever I give a talk, I usually like to, you know, know these um, questions here and um, the relationship people have with pronunciation. So I usually like to ask like the challenging words they find, uh, the accent that they have most trouble understanding and what their pronunciation goals are. So my PowerPoint slides are not showing. I don't know what's going on. Hope it shows now. How about now? How about now? Can you see my PowerPoint slides? Pictures? Yeah, just let me know if there's any, any problem. Okay, so these are some of the questions that I like to ask before I give a talk. So, um, and these are these regard their relationship with uh, pronunciation general and English. So I like to ask about the challenging words, uh, the accent that they find the most um, trouble like understanding and their pronunciation goals. If um, they are targeted at being understood and intelligibility or sounding like a native speaker. So we can talk about that um, at the end of this lecture. Um, before I talk about pronunciation more specifically, I like to start with a little bit of history and you'll understand why eventually. And the history of the English language, according to linguists, historians, go back to the fifth century. And a lot of people don't know, but the English language was not always written with the alphabet that we know today. Uh, back in the day, it used to be written with the like runic alphabet that we get to see in movies such as uh, The Lord of the Rings. Uh, the language back then was highly conjugated and Beowulf was the first poem ever written in the English language. 
And it was a language that originated in like mainland Europe. And it was taken to what we know today as British Isles. And it didn't um, had its origin here in the islands as many people think, but it was brought by some you know, tribes uh, on mainland Europe to the English, English uh, uh, in British Isles, as we say, sorry. <laughs> and um, uh, in the development of the language, we have like three main stages, uh, like historical stages. Um, and we call those like Old English, which goes back to the origin of the language, like Middle English, uh, during which many important uh, historical feats happen, and Modern English, Early and Late Modern English. And during the Middle English period, we had a very important um, event that happened. So the, the British Isles were um, under, under the, the Norman conquest for almost 3,000 years. And because of such con conquest, um, the English language was heavily influenced by French language. So that's why we have um, many words coming from French language, such as words in law, such as uh, liberty, liberté, arrest, arrêté, and many others. And back then, the territory here that we know as the United Kingdom today was uh, trilingual. So, but let's go um, forward, let's move forward to modernity and talk a little bit about sound change, which is one of my favorite topics. And in the early modern English period, which started around the 16th century, we had one of the most um, important events for the development of the English language uh, as far as sounds are concerned. And this is called the, the Great Vowel Shift. Uh, suddenly, uh, speakers of the language started to speak like differently from one another. And some of the historical facts which contributed to such uh, was like the mobility of English speakers. People started to travel more. And then we had like, uh, like an, an emergent like noble society and some social linguists believe that people started speaking differently back then, you know, people from this like, um, uh, let's say upper high class society. So they wanted to sound different from like the rest of the population. So this is one of the, um, the theories, even though it's not like 100% um, attested, but it's one of the theories that explain sound change. So um, basically, uh, as far as vowels are concerned, some of these vowels, they started to be like dithongized. Imagine that this is uh, like this triangle uh, shape is located. I don't know if you can see my face, but imagine it is located in your uh, vo uh, vocal tract, in your oral tract, right? And this is like E, A, uh, and U. Let's put it this way. And, you know, this is like the movement that these vowels, you know, uh, let's say made and, you know, um, they, they, they started to be dithong guys, but you don't have, there's not like a certain explanation for why this uh, feat happened. But what I want to call your attention to is that back in the day, um, in late Middle English period, uh, words they used to sound closer to the way they were spelled. Uh, according to linguists and historians, like the word that we pronounce name or name with a diphthong used to be pronounced with a uh, long A, like nam, nam. I think they even pronounce like this uh, last vowel here, and then nam, and then like many others, like feet was closer to, closer in pronunciation to, to the spelling than nowadays and many others. And one of the reasons for such, um, such change uh, throughout time is, um, you know, the, the great vowel shift as they try to explain. Well, as I said, the relationship between 
spelling and sound in English is quite an obscure one. And this happens because you have more sounds than letters of the alphabet to represent them because back in the day, English used to be written with a total different alphabet. And I really like to bring this poem because it shows how inconsistent a pronunciation, sound and spelling are in, in English because sometimes you have like the same uh, spelling combination but sounding completely different depending on the word and sometimes you have the opposite right i'm just gonna read the, the beginning of this poem here so that you can have a feel like i mean maybe some people uh, like in the audience are may may not be familiar with this but uh for instance it's very strange but did you know shoe will never rhyme with toe and foot will never sound like boot boots like suit and flute and fruit <laughs> Foots like foot and feet like C. So um, in this few examples here highlighted in yellow, you can see how inconsistent spelling and sound are um, in English. And I really like this quote by uh, Bernard Shaw that he says that English have no respect for their language and will not teach their children to speak it. They spell it so abom abominably that no man can teach himself what it sounds like. But I guess this is not a phenomenon exclusive to the English language. I guess there, there are other languages which have such uh, inconsistency as well. Even though like spelling helps, it should not be like um, like a like a, a like a hundred percent guide for pronunciation, especially when it comes to vowels, because when it comes to consonants, there are not like greater changes. However, when it comes to vowels, um, the situation is a lot more complicated. Well, in order to help speakers uh, from other languages to learn sounds of other languages better. So the International Phonetic Alphabet, also known as IPA, was invented. Linguists used um, letter-based symbols and other diacritics to represent all the sounds that were found in natural languages and imagine that this chart here is representing um your vocal tract once again and you have sounds which are produced with your lips you know at the, the at the beginning of your oral tract until like the very anterior anterior sounds such as like like glottal sounds so you have like places of articulation and manners of articulation. And basically, these are two of the main features of consonants in English. And I'm go just gonna tell you why in a little bit, why vowels are not featured here in the same chart together with consonants. But basically, consonants uh, as sounds are, are made, are based on place and manner of articulation. And there is something really important as well, which is called like voicing, because some sounds can be voiced, some sounds can be uh, voiceless. And this has to do with the movement that your vocal folds do when you are um, trying to get these sounds out. If they vibrate, for instance, as for the sound, b, b, as in, I don't know, bat, b, even before you produce the vowel, your vocal folds, they are already vibrating. They're located here. So if you place your fingertip against your, your throat, you can feel like vibration when you pronounce any of these sounds here on, on the right. Usually the sounds on the right, they are a voice and the sounds on the left, they are voiceless. So you have b, m, uh, n, n, they're all voice. And uh, the sounds on the left are voiceless. So that means that your vocal folds are not vibrating in order to get these sounds out. So, uh, such as p, t, s, et cetera. So now I'm going to explain why vowels are not featured in the same table, simply because uh, vowels are a completely different category even though there's like some like overlapping, there are some consonants which have vowel-like quality, such as l and r, for example, these are consonants 
which uh, are considered to have like vowel-like quality because sometimes in some words, in some languages, they become vowels, for instance, like the word Brazil in Brazilian Portuguese uh, becomes vocalized. Like we say Brazil instead of Brazil, I think, or Brazil, right? Even though some older people are going to pronounce like the, you know, like the, the lateral L sound, uh, I think most Brazilians on these, they tend to vocalize it, but this is uh, explained because of this, um, you know, um, vowel-like feature that, um, you know, the, the consonant L, uh, all the lateral L has, right? And this is um, a chart called the, the cardinal vowels, uh, which represents all the vowels which were found in the languages of the world. So I hope you're not scared to see all these vowels. I don't think I can even pronounce all of them, but this is just like a representat representation of, you know, um, such vowels. Um, and in English, you have, I think maybe a bit over like half these sounds here. So we're going to see the, the specific charts for the English language. But um, when it comes to vowel features, um, they, they vary, very much from consonants because, for example, when you produce vowels, there's no obstruction of air in your vocal uh, in your vocal tract. So uh, when you produce vowels, the air goes like freely out of your mouth. But when you produce consonants, so you have like obstructions because of the places like the p and manners of articulation. So uh, the vowels, they usually form a continuum in your mouth. So you, you could go from, for example, yeah, for instance, right? And I think that the fact that vowels form a continuum in your mouth makes them more difficult for language acquisition. This is my personal opinion. So I think they're a lot more difficult to be taught and acquired as well because um, it's, it's just harder because sometimes you just have to, to feel like your, your tongue height and, you know, frontness and backness. And I think this is a lot harder than, you know, place of articulation. Hope this is not too technical. So this is the vowel chart of English vowels. Of course, it varies from dialect to dialect. When I say dialect, I mean English variety. It's really funny because usually, like common sense, when you say dialect, you mean like a different variety of the language. But when a speech scientist says dialect, they actually mean a different variety variety of, of the language. And um, there are about 15 vowels in like most English um, dialects, right? And one thing really interesting about like sounds in general is that uh, no sound is equal to any sound in any language. I mean, cross-linguistically speaking, for instance, you have like the vowel C here. Um, and when you see like a, a vowel chart in Portuguese, you're going to have the same symbol, but they're going to be, as we say, acoustically different, right? So that's, that's why we sound so different when we speak other languages. It's because of, you know, these fine details, because this is just, uh, let's say, this is just a general rep representation. It doesn't mean that this vowel is being produced like right here, right? Because it's not, um, you know, that's not how anatomy and language works. Let's put it this way. For example, maybe the vowel in Portuguese is produced here. I don't think I brought an acoustic chart, but if you see like, because this is an articulatory chart, so it gives you an approximate figure of where like the, the, the vowels are, right? But if you see an acoustic ch chart, you see that they are, you know, all in different places. For example, the, the, the A in Portuguese is located here, A ah, and then A ah, in English is a little lower. Uh, even though they belong to the same, let's say, prototype to the same category, they sound like different, you know, they have like different, um, let's say different nuances, right? Because what makes vowel different from, um, from one another is because they have like different colors, different timbres. But inside these prototypes, you have like different varieties as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, one important thing to learn when we learn about sounds and phonetics is that no sound is equal to any other sound um, in, in different languages. And this is uh, the, the English consonant chart. We have about 24 consonants and you can probably recognize most of these consonants here because 
we have most of them in Portuguese, I guess, except for the, um, the um, like the TH sound, as we say, or the incidental fricative sounds in words such as think and this, right? And I love to call attention to the ch, ch and j, right? Because even though this pair sound features in both English and Portuguese, they have different functions. For instance, uh, in English, ch and j and j distinguish between pairs of words. For example, when you say, for example, tear and chair, tear and chair. And uh, well, like there, and uh, I don't know, I can think of another one here. But for example, t and ch, they, they belong to the language official inventory, like the English language official inventory. However, in Portuguese, these are just variation. For example, the t and ch before a high vowel such as e, like tia, tia, chia, this is just like um, variation. It just, um, says that you, you come like from a different place, right? But it has no implication for meaning. However, when you say like tear and chair, in English, you're saying two complete different words. So that's why they have like, a, let's say a, a higher like semantic and value function in English than in Portuguese, because in Portuguese, uh, it's just a variation, okay? Um, Okay, so this is one of the exercises that I like um, to bring in my workshops because even though it looks like really simple, there are still like differences that we should uh, pay attention at. For instance, like the, you know, this distinction between ship and sheep is not only the fact that it is shorter, people say shorter than E, right? But the thing is they have like different qualities. This one is um, more similar to the one that we have in Portuguese. However, it's not identical, as I said. And this first one is more, let's say, this, this one is completely different. It's a complete different, like, prototype category. Uh, in order to achieve the more accurate pronunciation of the sound, I usually ask people to say, like, Portuguese words with the letter E, as in, like, estrela, and then you try to say with your mouth closed, like estrela, estrela, like really strange. So that strange sound is the e, e sound. Not, not only because it's prototypically shorter than e, but it has a different quality to it, a different timbre, a different color, right? So um, these are some of the differences, right? Not only like duration, because we tend to refer to this pair of, of sounds as being like one longer and shorter than the other. But um, there's um, a color that distinguishes them because even though you, you say like ship, yeah, it's usually a bit shorter, but you can say like ship and give emphasis. So the vowel is still going to be the same. So the, the, the vowel quality is not going to, to change. And as for sheep, which is closer to the sound that we have in Portuguese, it is still a bit different because you have to um, produce it in a like tensor way. Um, when you say words in Portuguese, such as, um, I don't know, igreja, uh, try to say like igreja as, um, as if it were in English. So you would say something like igreja, like peak, as in the example we see here, like take a peek at the pig, peek at the pig. I guess in English, you when you're saying like the, um, this vowel here, the E, so you're like smiling, so your lips are, are tensored than they are in Portuguese when you say E. And when you say E, your lips are like more relaxed, right? So your, your, your tongue is like lower in your mouth. So when you say E, your, your tongue is like closer to the, to the hard palate, right? And when you say E, so you, you, you relax a little bit. So you have like E, E and E, right? So E um, is the sound that you have both in English and Portuguese, and then you have E that you only have in Portuguese, and then you have E, right? Which is like something in the middle, like articulatorily speaking. And this is an exercise that I, that I like to, <laughs> to, to perform, right? I'm just going to um, 
play a little here so that you um, can have an idea. But basically, you're going to you're going to listen to um, like a word being pronounced, and then you have to uh, tell which one was produced. And these are minimal minimal pairs. These are uh, groups of words which are distinguished by only one sound. Even though, like for example, bit and beat, you have like more letters here. But what matters here is sound. So um, both words are are made of a combination of like three different sounds, even though we have like more letters here. And the only difference um, between like bit, bit and beat is the, the vowel is the vowel sound. Right. And the second one, the second exercise that I like to do is I usually have like groups and have people um, produce one of the sentences, like you're working with pairs and then um, your your friend, your interlocutor is producing a sentence and then you have to just say, if, if they said like A or B, like this is a sin or this is a scene, you know, just to test your perception a little bit. Um, yeah, basically, I don't know, I'm just, I don't know if it's a bit One. Bit. Yeah, basically, this is just a... Uh, two. Eat. And so on and so forth, right? This is just, um, uh, let's say, a, a perception exercise that can be done like through like audio media or when uh, learners are a little bit more confident when it comes to producing um, this, uh, th this difference. So uh, we can move to, to the next. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to show a software I have here. I'll, sh I'll share my, my screen once again. And this is a software that I that I like to use with my my learners or mentees now, because <laughs> I'm giving more mentorships than um, than classes nowadays. But basically, what I like to call people attention to is not only what they hear and what they are producing, but uh, the muscles involved in production, because this makes the the whole difference, right? So you just have to. Right, like the, the 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 you have to to find the right way to like uh, use your muscles. Like, of course, this is um, hyper articulated, so you can know the difference. Nobody talks like this, but um, so just like isolated words, so that you can uh, you know perceive the differences eat. better. So you have like eat, which is uh, because in Portuguese if we say eat, we're simply going to say eat, eat, right? Um, and for the second one, it, it, right. See, like the, the articulatory movement here is really important because for it, like you barely open your mouth to produce this sound here. Whereas for the Portuguese, e, as in estrela, so you have to open your mouth a little wider, right? So this is, this is why I say that, um, um, like knowing articulation and the, the muscles that you, you know, putting into action is really important in order to get, you know, sounds more, more accurately. So I just showed like a little bit of vowels, maybe I can uh, approach consonants. And there's so much controversy around um, the learning of we technically call them intradental fricatives, and I'll explain why. It looks like a very frightening term, but uh, <laughs> intradental refers back to their like place of articulation. It means that they are produced uh, between your upper and lower teeth. And fricatives is because you're making friction when you say the all this like hissing sounds. They are fricative sounds because of the friction that your articulators produce. So that's why they're technically called like intradental fricatives, and they can be of the voiceless and the voiced kind and um and um they are also known as like the th sound right um but i don't particularly like this term very much because um it gives us an impression that letters have sound right you can see oh, the th sound the t the 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 combination of letter that has a sound but it's important to Keep in mind that these letters are like representing sounds because uh, um, because the same 
a lot of combination can represent different sounds in different languages. Uh, so that's why it is a bit criticized. Um, okay, as for the intradental fricatives, there's something really interesting because according to uh, linguists and speech scientists, this is the pair of sounds which is uh, acquired even by native speakers, like really like later in life. Uh, according to research, the voiceless counterpart, the th as in thanks, uh, is only acquired fully around the age of six by native speakers. So that's why they cause uh, trouble to um, second language acquisition, for instance. Um, so they are acquired later in life by, by you know, non-native speakers of the English language. And also because of what we call linguistic universals, because um, it is considered by some linguists um, that this, these sounds are produced in a very uh, complex uh, combination because you have to you know, put your, uh, the, the tip of your tongue between your upper and lower teeth, right? And you have to produce friction, like, so this is considered complex. And this explains why this combination of sounds is really rare in the word languages. So I can think of like few word languages that contain this pair of sounds, like uh, as, as part of like the official system, like maybe Icelandic, uh, English, and we have it in some varieties of Spanish, right? We have the, the ceseriado as they call it, right? In words such as zapato or cebolla, right? Um, we even, have this like the th sound in some varieties of Italian, like in, I can, I don't know if it's the, the Toscano, I can remember now, but we have this th sound in some varieties of uh, Italian language as well, but it's not like part of like the official system and it's really rare in the word languages. And there's a lot of uh, discussion about whether about whether these sounds should be um, should be taught or or not, because uh, they don't cause much trouble for for second language uh, acquisition. I'm reopening the, the presentation now because apparently it's not okay. I hope you can see it now. Okay, and this is just like more practice. I wish you had more time. And if, if the, the goal of this lecture was like more interactive, we could, you know, try to practice uh, these sounds here. And also um, th there's something which regards like perception as well. Why are these sounds so difficult to produce? I believe that especially the, the, the voiceless one as in thin, faith, thunder, 10th, right? I think it's because of the, you know, like low acoustic energy because it can barely perceive these sounds because they are voiceless. They are articulated in a very, um, involving very complex place and, and manners of our articulation. So they are diff difficult to perceive, I guess. So you end up perceiving it as, as, a, as a, an, an adjacent segment such as, or sometimes right? Which are uh, adjacent um, segments, right? So this is just like um, a, a few exercises that I sometimes bring in my workshops, depending on the learner's levels. Some of these sentences do not even make sense, but I, I use them for, for practice, right? Uh, this is the shadowing technique, as they say, right? As I, as I, as I, uh, described here, the shadowing technique is basically to uh, repeat an audio file just after you hear it with, you know, like maybe a second difference between like the, the, the audio you're repeating and your own repetition. And this way you can try to copy, especially like intonation. And I think it's very good practice for connected speech. I don't know if everybody here in the audience is familiar with the shadowing technique. Let me see if I'm able to show it to you a little bit. That's funny because I only tested this technique like recently. Uh, I always like picked 
sounds like by year I had some training, but uh, you know, the shadowing technique, I only started to use it when I started learning Japanese. So if, if well, I hope I'm not being redundant. If, um, if there's anyone here in the audience who's not familiar with the technique, I'm just gonna show you a little bit how it works. Hope I'm not sounding Thank too you. redundant. So you basically should uh, choose, uh, I don't know, like a video. You can do it like every day. Like people say, some people say that 10 minutes every day is, 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 is good. So uh, it works like this. I hope you can hear the Thank audio. Thank you for being here. I, I, I want to talk about the I new, talk about uh, the new song. Uh, uh, I, I, I know in, I know Brazil, in Brazil, you, uh, the biggest star, the, the biggest massive, star. I mean, massive, it's insane. You went insane. Uh, platinum. Uh, you it's platinum, crazy. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. And, I mean, and how does yeah, and then you, you know, you, you, you keep repeating it. People say that it's not good if you have like the, the transcription or if you pause, but I think you can, uh, you know, just take it in your stride and uh, do it like the best way you can. These are like some problematic uh, words for uh, second language learners, even like mature ones, even, even speakers who are at a very, let's say high intermediate level or even advanced, some people still have trouble to, to produce worlds like girl world, uh, mischievous. That's funny because mischievous is a word that is mispronounced even by native speakers. Sometimes they say mischievous. And also like uh, words inherited, um, borrowed from other languages. For example, there are words such as um, entrepreneur and genre, which in my opinion, they're a bit hard to pronounce because they, they come from French language. And when English speakers try to say them, they try to keep the original pronunciation and mix with the, you know, with the, let's say English language syllable uh, patterns, right? And Christmas as well is, is an example of a word which has like silent letters. And uh, some words such as like thumb, for example, or lamb, right? There's, um, I don't know if you'll be able to see what I write, but there are some um, there are some words which have like an explanation. For instance, well, I cannot. Yeah, I'm trying to write here, but I just can't. Well, I just can't find the. Anyway, I just couldn't find the tool. But anyways, words such as like thumb and um, what was the word I said? Said thumb and lamb, for instance. So you end up not producing the last consonant, but in both of these words, because the previous consonant ha has the same place of articulation. So when you say ma and ba, so um, these sounds are, are, are labeled bilabial sounds, right? Because they're produced with uh, your both of your lips, right? So if you hyper articulated like lamb and, um, and uh, thumb, it would sound like really unnatural. So what happens is uh, in a simulation of both sounds because of this, um, this uh, place of articulation uh, feature. Words such as like spaceship, we end up saying uh, spaceship. So we end up like in connected speech, we tend to you know, drop a few sounds just for like ease of articulation because we tend to do what's easiest um, when it comes to you know, getting sounds out, right? And in order to wrap up this, this presentation, I would like to leave a few uh, recommendations of digital resources. Um, some of these you can find freely on the internet. Uh, Sounds of Speech is a platform um, uh, put together by the Iowa University, and it's really referred to in most language courses in Brazil, I mean like a language like academic courses and, and undergraduate courses in language. You have pronunciation power. I never used it, but it has like many interesting features and even like acoustic analysis, but you have to pay in order to have access to this one. And then you have like the accent coach, which is like really good pronunciation practice. You have Kings. And before I wrap up, this should have come before, but before I wrap this presentation up, I'd like to touch on a few important concepts when it comes to like the learning of pronunciation. So when learning pronunciation, you have to take into consideration a concept called a functional load, 
which um, has to do with the contrastive potential that a specific pair of sounds, just as we saw previously, like e, e, the, and the, play in a specific language. Like the number of words that such uh, specific pairs they they distinguish in the language. So the more words are distinguished by a specific pair, the higher the functional load, the, the more important it is for second language acquisition. For example, e and e um, distinguish like many word pairs in English. So it is considered to have like higher functional load. So it should be really like focused in second language acquisition. However, the the and the are, this pair is contained in function words such as, you know, uh, articles, prepositions, and is not considered like a, a problem for um, for communication. So it has like a lower functional load. Um, hope I'm not sounding too technical. And uh, there are other like three important uh, concepts in second language acquisition when learning sounds. We should be considered um, when deciding which sounds to learn if you don't have time like to cover them all right so accuracy has to do with the you know how precise pronunciation of certain segments is regarding a specific native language uh, form right and intelligibility has to do with the degree uh, which people uh, understand and are understood in conversation and comprehensibility is very similar to intelligibility. However, it has um, to do with uh, the effort that the listener puts you into uh, understanding your speech. And it's really interesting because all these con con concepts are interconnected because uh, for intelligibility, you need a degree of accuracy, right? And for comprehensibility as well, Okay, and another concept that I would like to touch on before, um, before wrapping this presentation up is a proposal that was made uh, long ago by a linguist called uh, Jennifer Jenkins, and she proposed the Lengua Franca Core, which is a list of sounds which should be focused in, in pronunciation teaching in order to achieve like more uh, intelligible and comprehensible communication in multilingual settings. So um, vowels, she considered like really important. They should, you know, all contrasts should be, should be taught like consonants, they should all be taught except for the pair that we just talked about, the aspiration on pa, ta, and ka, which is uh, different in, in different languages. Um, and the true T's should be, should be um, preferred um, and not the the the, the sound as, as in American English. I don't know if she <laughs> she proposed that because she's um I don't know she's a she's a she's a British or because of you know really intelligibility. Maybe it's easier to understand water water than water. Yeah, that that was was her idea, but it was you know this this lingua franca core is. I, I think it's really interesting, but it's, it is criticized by some researchers. Um, yeah, we would need time to discuss that. And uh, before leaving some uh, reading recommendations, I'd like to end this presentation with this, this video. It's just a clip from the Pink Panther. So I'm just gonna play just a, a, a tiny bit before the reading recommendations and uh, wrapping up this, this presentation. I hope you enjoy. This is from the Pink Panther. I think I haven't even watched the movie, but I, I, I think this um, movie clip is really, is really funny because this woman acts as, um, as a um, pronunciation coach, as a speech coach, because this guy who she's coaching is trying to uh, speak English like, like closer like to, to natives, but he plays um, the role of a, a, sprint, a sprint speaker in the movie. And I think he wants to act as a spy in the movie. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit of uh, their coaching session. I, uh, I, I would, 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 
would would like like like, like to 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 buy the. Bye. B. Bye. B. B. A. A. Hamburger. 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 A hamburger. 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 Ham. M. B. B. G. G. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. It's not damburger. Hamburger. I'm not saying damburger. I said I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. I would like to buy the hamburger. Hamburger. I would like to buy a hamburger. Maybe we should stop. We don't quit. We do not quit. Again, again. Robson, seu microfone está desligado. Oops, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so um, as I was saying here with the mic like, muted, uh, this is the picture of what people think a coaching transition coaching session is like, but it's it's not like that. This is just a, um, I don't know, an exaggerated picture of it. And for um, calling it a day, I'd like to, to leave these three um, book recommendations uh, for the ones who want to know more about pronunciation. This first one is a book called Teaching Pronunciation, which has many um, activities, tasks, exercises. And this is kind of like a new version and it is considered um, a very good uh, book reference for people who want to improve their pronunciation or even like improve like teaching pronunciation because it contains many resources and it has become a reference book in the area. The second one is a more recent one. It was launched last year and it reunites like research from um, Brazilian language specialists, um, pronunciation specialists. And they also bring like contributions for, you know, for, for teaching activities, but they also bring like the, the research that was carried out. So you have like, um, it's like they're trying to um, bridge the gap between theory and practice. So that's what they try to do here. And the second book here um, is a bit similar to the previous one, but it's more focused on English, uh, whereas the, the previous one is focused on different languages. And the reason why I, I'd like to recommend it is because I wrote a chapter, it was one of my first chapters, maybe my first chapter in, on pronunciation. And it is co-written by Elizabeth Bunch. So I wrote this with another um, friend who's a specialist in pronunciation, second language acquisition, and speech science. Okay, so this is the end of this presentation. I hope you didn't get too bored. Thank you so much.